Welcome back, Apology 8th grade, Physical Science, week six, day one, textbook, pages 79 to 85, notebook pages 69 through 72. I wanna sort of pause here real quick today and mention about note taking. You should be getting the hang of taking notes and studying for tests. Have you noticed how taking thorough notes can help you remember important information? If your notes have not been as much help as you'd like, you should begin to add more detail to them. You can try using colored pencils to draw attention to an important point. In this module, module three, you may find that adding sketches to the structures you'll read about will help you remember the key concepts. These notes are yours, so add whatever detail you need to help you learn the material. Not just because it's required to do the homework, they should be beneficial and helpful to you. All right, moving right along. So as I mentioned, we are starting module three today. Chemistry, yay, the atomic structure and the periodic table. Um, we plan on discussing in this module a few main ideas, the history of the atom, modern atomic theory, organizing elements in the periodic table, and represent, uh, representative groups. All right, a history of the atom. And I think this is where you wanna open up your notebook onto page 70 and start to take some notes. So let's quickly review module two as some of these words are um, gonna be useful. Matter can be classified into one of the following groups. I hope we can remember the first is pure substances and those are your elements and your compounds. Then there are mixtures. Atoms are the basic building blocks of matter. Atoms are the smallest particle of an element that still has all the same properties of that element. All right. Although no one has really ever seen an atom, let's really dive into this and understand what we're talking about here. Again, continue to take notes on page on your notebook, page 70. All right, although no one has seen an atom, we have a lot of evidence of their existence and behavior. In fact, this image is a colored scanning transmission electron micrograph of silicon atoms in a sheet of graphene. New microscopes like the scanning transmission electron microscope or the STEM are making it easier to see the atoms. So here you go. I put the schematic of a STEM microscope. What do I mean? Well, the STEM passes electricity across a thinly sliced sample and measures the interactions between the electricity and the atoms of the sample. The microscope sends that data to a computer which uses very complicated mathematical equations from a theory called quantum mechanics to calculate what the atoms on the surface of the object should look like. The computer then creates a virtual image of that sample and adds color to enhance the quality of the image. So, what you're really seeing in figure 3.2 is the result of a calculation that comes from a theory about how electricity flows and interacts with parts of atoms under certain circumstances. Thus, if the theory is correct, and if the computer calculation is correct, then what you are seeing is a representation of atoms on the surface of the substance examined with the stem. Now, I personally think that both the theory and the calculations are correct. So I do think that what you see in this figure, excluding the color which was added, is probably a good representation of how the silicon and graphene atoms are arranged. So even with such modern tools as the STEM, we still have not seen the atoms. However, if the computer calculations are correct, we can see the representation of atoms. 
Ancient Atomic Models. Let's go back about 2,500 years to discuss or learn the history of the atom, which took place around 400 BC. A Greek philosopher named Democritus pondered what would happen if a piece of matter, such as a grape, was cut into smaller and smaller pieces. He reasoned that there would, be, there would come a point at which the grape could not be cut any smaller. He called the smallest uncuttable piece atomos. Democritus's philosophy of matter being composed of atoms held up until about a hundred years later when Aristotle, another Greek philosopher, began debating the topic. Now keep in mind that the idea of experimentation was not yet developed, so scholars of this time period would argue or debate their ideas. The philosopher who could argue the best or debate the best was considered right, even if his argument was completely wrong. So as one of the most influential philosophers of the time, Aristotle rejected Democritus's idea of atoms, thinking that that was ridiculous. Aristotle argued that a substance could be divided indefinitely and that there was not a limit to how small the resulting particle could be. Therefore, there could be no such thing as an atom. Aristotle upheld the view of yet another Greek philosopher, Empedocles, who reasoned that everything we see is made up of four elements, earth, water, air, and fire, and that those four elements were further connected into four qualities, hot, cold, wet, and dry. He argued that every single thing on earth was made up of these four elements in varying proportions. He also suggested that one substance could become another through the through the quality that they had in common. For example, earth can become fire through the action of dryness of fire, or fire could become air through the action of heat. Aristotle also argued that there was no limit to the number of times a substance could be divided. So unlike Democritus, his view was that there was no fundamental indivisible particle of matter. Unfortunately, Aristotle's powers of persuasion were so great and most people just accepted Aristotle's view on the structure of matter for about 2,000 years. This is why alchemists of the Dark and Middle Ages were continually trying to turn metal into gold. They reasoned based on Aristotle's theory that if all substances possess the same four elements in different proportions, why couldn't one substance be transformed into another? Moving on to notebook page 71. Let's jump ahead and look at these vocabulary definitions before we start talking about Dalton. So we have the law of conservation of mass. Matter cannot be created or destroyed, but it can change form. We should have heard that before many times. And then the law of constant composition. Samples of a pure compound always have the same elements and the same mass proportion. So go ahead and write that down on uh, notebook page 71. Now we're going to go back a little and talk about Dalton's atomic theory. All right. Aristotle's erroneous ideas persisted into the late 1700s. How could a wrong scientific idea last that long? That's a good question. One possible explanation is that the language of science was Greek because that was the language of the ancient Greek philosophers. As the world became more Latin under the Roman Empire and then entered the Middle Ages, much of the scientific and philosophical knowledge of the Greeks was lost. The Greek texts were rediscovered during the Renaissance and began to, the, to be translated. It was during the late 1700s when scientists such as Lavoisier began to suggest that Aristotle had been seriously wrong. So it's not until 1808 that science fully revives Democritus's ideas and returns to the atom. John Dalton, who was an English chemist and teacher, began experiments and making observations on the behavior 
of gases and physical and chemical changes. After making many observations and gathering evidence for the existence of atoms, Dalton developed a theory to explain why elements in a compound always join in the same proportion. Dalton proposed the following point in his theory. All matter is made of particles called atoms, which cannot be divided into smaller particles. Atoms cannot be created or destroyed. All atoms of the same element are identical in mass and properties, and the atoms of different elements have different masses and properties. Atoms from two or more different elements join together to form compounds in chemical reactions. And chemical reactions rearrange atoms, but in specific compounds, the atoms of different elements always combine in the same way. Dalton's atomic theory was the first complete attempt to describe the matter in terms of atoms. Continue um, taking notes on the bottom of page 71. All right, this is actually very cool, and I need you to understand this. The conservation of mass experiment. All right, look at the figure 3.5. This is a modern experiment providing evidence for the law of conservation of mass. Notice in the beakers on the left that there is a clear liquid substance in each of the two beakers. Now, look at the two beakers on the right which are the beakers after the one clear liquid was poured into the beaker of the other. Notice that one is empty and the other contains a cloudy, milky liquid. Well, we learned in last module, module two, that a color change like that shown in the figure indicates a chemical change has taken place. But look at the mass shown on the mass scale that the beakers are sitting on both before and after the chemical reaction, the scale indicates the exact same mass, providing more evidence to support the law of convert, uh, conservation of mass, which says matter cannot be created or destroyed. It can change form, but it cannot be created or destroyed. Discovery of the law of constant composition is credited to Joseph Proust, a French chemist who lived around the same time as Dalton was conducting experiments. Proust conducted experiments in which he found evidence that chemical compounds will always have a specific composition. Like in other words, if you chemically mix hydrogen and oxygen gases together, and of course add a little energy, you will always get water with the elements in the ratio of two hydrogen atoms to one oxygen atom, which is exactly what Dalton was finding in his own experiments. But Proust is actually the one given um, credit for the law of constant composition. Take a moment to think about how the process of science occurred here. Lavoisier uses a scientific law to make predictions on how matter will behave. The law describes the behavior but doesn't explain it. He then conducts experiments and records his observations, providing more and more evidence that supports the scientific law. Likewise, Proust conducts experiments and they provide and they provide evidence for the law of constant composition. Neither man can explain why, ma why mass is conserved or composition is constant in his experiments, but can see that every time he conducts an experiment, his predictions are validated. Then, 30 years later, Lavoisier, an independent of Proust, Dalton does some research and starts experimenting, knowing what each of these laws predicts. Through his experiments, he starts to formulate some reasons for how mass can be conserved and how compounds have constant compositions. He does many more experiments based on his hypothesis of how the atoms behave in chemical reactions. After conducting many experiments that validate all of his predictions, he develops a theory. Remember that a theory must explain the data from many experiments by scientific 
by scientists attempting to test the theory. Because Dalton's atomic theory met this goal, it became widely accepted. So that just begs the question, what does all of this science sound like? Please remember this. We talked all about this in module one. The scientific method. You can see here how there were questions, there were observations, there were hypotheses, there was um, experiments, there was data, um, validated data by multiple different scientists over the course of many years. Now, as it turns out, years later, some of Dalton's atomic theory was revised. Dalton's theory proposed that the atom is the smallest indivisible unit of an element. He used solid wooden spheres of different sizes as models of atoms, of elements. Uh, we will see that evidence has accumulated that disproves that idea. But instead of discarding all of Dalton's atomic theory, that part of the theory was revised to account for the new discoveries you're going to read about next. So most of Dalton's atomic theory is still accepted today. This is a great example of how science works. In 1897, an English scientist, J.J. Thompson, conducted some experiments with gas tubes and electric currents to learn more about atoms. During his experiments, Thompson observed that electricity consists of flowing negatively charged particles. He further observed that all matter gave off or gives off small negatively charged particles. This discovery was important because many scientists during Thompson's time, thought that electric current was positively charged and behaved like light rays rather than particles. The results of Thompson's experiments are showed that negative particles from any substance are all alike, but that they're smaller than an atom. No matter what metal disk Thompson used, the negative particles were identical and always had the same mass. He determined that these negative particles could not be the smallest fundamental unit of matter because they were all identical regardless of the element. Remember, Dalton's theory stated that different elements have different atoms with different properties, which was still supported by all of the data. But Thompson's experiments were the first ones that provided evidence that atoms are made of even smaller particles. Thompson concluded that the negative particles must be part of the atom. The negatively charged particles were much later called electrons. Thompson knew that atoms are neutral in charge, which means that an atom is neither negatively nor positively charged. So he questioned how an atom could be neutral and yet contain these negative particles which, again, we now know as electrons. He reasoned that there must be an equal amount of positive charge in the atom. William Thompson, absolutely no relation, described the atom as similar to a traditional English dessert, plum pudding, in which the plums are scattered throughout the pudding. If you're like me and have never seen plum pudding, you can think of it more like a blueberry muffin model in which the negatively charged blueberries are randomly spread throughout the positively charged muffin dough. Figure 3.8 is an illustration of Thompson's plum pudding model and a blueberry muffin. The red sphere and the muffin represent the positively charged mass of matter and the yellow and the smaller yellow spheres and the blueberries represent the negatively charged particles evenly scattered throughout. All right, I hope this um, helped a little bit talking about um, the history of the atom. On your own, 3.1, what is the difference between Democritus's and Aristotle's view of matter? Democritus argues that the smallest indivisible unit of matter is the atom. Aristotle ar argued that all matter is made up of four elements, fire, earth, water, and air, in varying proportions. 
um, on your own 3.2. Why was Dalton's model of the atom changed after Thomson's experiments? When Thomson's evidence supported the idea that the atom is made of smaller particles, Dalton's model was changed to reflect that new evidence. And lastly, on your own 3.3, what evidence from Thomson's experiment led him to conclude that the glowing beam contained negatively charged particles? The glowing beam of electricity was attracted to the positively charged plate and repelled by the negatively charged plate. All right, so that concludes week six, day one.